solids dissolving in water. Remember, this is from like unit one stuff coming back here. The water molecules around the ions in the correct orientation. So you have a cation, the oxygen side of the water, which are the partial negative side. They're going to surround the uh, cations. And then the uh, hydrogen side will surround the anion. So remember, if you have sodium chloride crystal, NaCl like so, and it's going to break apart, you're going to end up getting an Na plus, and then you're going to end up getting also a Cl minus. Cl's are bigger than the Na, so I just drew it bigger. But then your waters are going to come in, so the oxygen side, and try to do the Mickey Mouse ears, type water. The oxygen side of the water, okay, is going to be your partial negative. The hydrogen sides are your partial positive. So remember the Lewis dot structure of water. It's a polar molecule. This side's negative, this side's positive. Okay. Uh, keep that in mind. So we would draw these, you know, with the oxygen facing in around the sodium. And then on the chlorine, the hydrogen sides would be the ones facing inward. Okay surrounding the chloride, but the hydrogen sides are the partial positive. And this is actually what was going on in that hand warmer lab that we just did. When we were dissolving your ionic salt, there was an ionic bond that had to um, be overcome. It's a coulombic attraction. We'll talk about that on the next slide. That had to be overcome to break the ionic solid apart and make it soluble. Then the water molecules themselves, their hydrogen bonding had to be overcome so that they made spaces for the ionic solids to, to go in between them and then they start surrounding them, reforming that ion dipole force. The three step thing going on in uh, the dissolution process, dissolving process of an ionic solid, dissociation, if you want to call it that too, that's another good word for it. Okay, so remember this important thing, the IMF attraction are formed, the water and the ions. Let's take a look at those particular attractive forces. So the coulombic attractions, which are the positive negative attractions of an ionic solid, so like the cations, positive charge attracts the negative anion's charge, and that's that it's a strong force, it's an electrostatic force, has to be overcome though in order to pull those ions apart and separate them. And that process of overcoming it, you have to add in energy to do that. So that's an endothermic process. That was like your delta H1 in the lab. In the very front page when I was talking about the delta H1, the delta H2, and the delta H3, this part was getting the ionic solid to break apart. The second part, this was the delta H2, was getting the waters to separate. Overcoming that hydrogen body, that takes energy to do that too. Okay? Overcoming forces takes energy. Right? It's more difficult. Then once they were separated, spaces in between the ions and the water start you know, the water starts surrounding the ions, that creates an ion dipole force. That ion dipole force is exothermic because that's forming a new force, exothermic, and this was your delta H3 in the hand warmer lab, So, which is an exothermic process. So if the energy released in the forming of the ion dipole force was greater than the other two, you know you had an overall exothermic reaction. If the other two, where it took the energy to separate them, delta H1, delta H2 for the two top ones, if that was more energy, it ended up being an endothermic process, okay? So kind of going back to this idea of the ionic solids dissolving in solution, you have your coulombic attractions, your hydrogen bonding, your ion dipole forces, all these things have to take place in order to get the ionic solid to separate, get the waters to separate, and then the new force forming, surrounding the ions with the water molecules. Lots going on there. Lots of stuff going on there. And like I said, it's a good, that's why it's a good point to do the hand warmer lab in between, because then you're going to reiterate these things. Hand warmer lab um, calculations and processes are on this unit test as well. So keep that in mind. So that's how it's going to apply here and when we're talking about the ionic solids dissolving. So 
what do these equations actually look like? Just like unit one, what happened when we were breaking up our ionic solids? They break apart into their ions, right? So NaCl is going to separate how? Na plus, and then it's going to be Aq because it's dissolving in the water, and you're going to get your Cl minus, which is also Aq. How about ammonium phosphate? NH4 is a plus one, yes. How many of them, though, are going to fall into solution when we just when we break apart this crystal? Three. So you need a three here, right? Okay, the three there. Also, AQ. And then we get a phosphate out of it, which is what charge? Three minus, good, and that's what we get out of that one. Now let's look at the barium fluoride. That one's going to break apart. We're going to get a BA with a two plus, and you're going to get two of our fluoride in solution. And last but not least, aluminum carbonate. What are we going to see there? Al. How many of them? Two. What's uh, aluminum charge? Three plus. And then the carbonate has a charge of minus two, and there's three of them. Aq. I want you to pay particular attention to the bottom two here. What do we know about those particular compounds? They're on the insoluble side of the solubility <coughs> chart. Okay, remember you have your soluble ones and you have your insoluble ones. Well, it'd be nice if everything was just black and white like that and didn't have these two categories. However, it's actually a gradient as to how soluble you are. Now, things that are in the soluble side of things are definitely soluble. But every single ionic salt, to a certain degree, is going to dissolve a little, a little bit. And it's based off of this AST value we're going to talk about. Okay? And we're going to be in equilibrium. There's going to be dissolving to the saturation point. In some solutions, the saturation point is very quick. Some solutions, like your soluble salt, the saturation point is going to shift. As you're going to add more stuff to it in order to get it to saturate. So if you're looking here, hopefully you can re write these um, dissolution reactions. The ammonium is always soluble, so that one would be soluble, and then of course the sodium is always soluble, so alkaline, alkaline metals are always soluble. So you're going to have to remember and, and look at these, but we're mainly focusing on how soluble are a lot of these ones that are in the insoluble category. So we're really going to be focusing on them. So, yes, the process of dissolving is reversible. So there's an equilibrium that gets established. It's an equilibrium, too. So you can dissolve stuff to the saturation point. You get to that saturation point, though, and it becomes super saturated if you try to add more so the crystals fall to the bottom. Okay? So we're going to figure out what that saturation point is. And it's going to be based off of this KST value. The K, it's also like a, it's an equilibrium constant for dissolving stuff. It's called the solubility product. So we're going to be looking at how uh, the equilibrium constant, the amount you can dissolve of certain ionic solids. And like I said, the ones on the insoluble side, you're not going to be able to dissolve a whole lot. But you'll definitely have a fractional amount that you'll be able to do for most of them. So if we say a solution of sodium chloride is saturated, we're saying that in this reaction, the equilibrium has been established. You hit that maximum amount that can be dissolved in there. You're at that equilibrium point of dissolution. So if you add more, you're going to go this way. If you add more to it, it's not going to dissolve anymore, so you're going to start precipitating out solids. That's where you get that super saturated solution. So once you reach that saturation point, you won't be able to add anymore. And it does have an equilibrium, like I said, and we're going to assign that proportional ratio to it. 
Solubility is the measurement we use. Usually, in what you know of solubility, solubility was determined by the uh, amount of grams per 100 grams of water. That's what we've seen on our solubility curves. So really, though, you can give it any unit you really want to. You could do grams per 100 grams of water. You could do grams per milliliter. You know, solubility is really just a measurement value. We're going to be looking at it in terms of molar solubility in the moles amount later on. So keep that in mind, too. So we're looking at solubility as a measurement and uh, amount of the solute per solvent of solution, amount of solvent, okay. So let's revisit and take a look here at those solubility curves. You remember those from last year? Yes, you have to be able to read these. And it does say right here, solubility of the salt per 100 grams of water. So that's the one that we were using last year. And as you see, the ability to dissolve stuff is dependent on temperature. Yes, the ability to dissolve things is temperature dependent. And as you see on here, most of them increase their solubility as you increase the temperature. So most of them, if you're increasing the temperature, where would the temperature be or the heat be in this reaction? Is it a reaction for a product? It's a reaction. So most of these are endothermic. The ones where it increases as the temperature increases are endothermic dissolving processes. <laughs> I here it shows you this one right here where it decreases. And most gases also follow this. The ones when you try to dissolve gases into liquids, they are exothermic. They like it to be cooler. So as you decrease the temperature, they become more soluble. So keep that in mind that most of our salts up here, because they increase with temperature, that means heat the reactant. Okay? <coughs> heat the reactant as you increase temperature. Most of these processes are endothermic. Most. Like I said, this one where it's declining, that one's an exothermic one, where taking away the heat actually makes it dissolve more. Yes. Why would you want? Well, some are. This one is not a gas, but. Some, a lot of the ones like in soda, you notice if you have, if you open a can of soda that is at room temperature and you open one that's been in the fridge, which one's going to go flat first? The room temperature one because it's warmer. So gases will stay dissolved at lower temperatures. So most of our ionic salts do fall under this category of the endothermic. If you increase the temperature, you can get more in there. You can dissolve more if you, if you so choose to. So the KFTs are always going to be temperature dependent too. 